Okay, we're going to go ahead and begin with the word of prayer. People will catch up, and then there's always the video. So let's open a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight, and we ask forgiveness of our sins. And we ask for your guidance and strength. We want to do your will. May you cleanse us from every wickedness, from every evil thought, Father. Purify us through the washing of the word and give us the strength to do your will. Father, I ask that you would continue to, to send your spirit to us, that the spirit would fill us, that we would be filled with the peace that passes all understanding, that you give us guidance and strength, be with our families. Father, I pray now as we study your word that you would continue to give us insight into how to properly handle your word, to, to recognize that there's a depth and that you've called us to not only to, to have a life full of good works, but also to be filled with the, with the, to be filled with the knowledge of, of, of your son and that we are also to, to um, do this through all spiritual wisdom and insight, Father. So I just pray now as there is a, a human responsibility here for us to study your word that you would give us guidance and, and, and strength to do your will. So in Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things. Amen. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into the PowerPoint. And tonight what we will be studying is word studies. So session number seven is word studies. And I believe that there was a reading. And so in some ways this is really connected with the reading that for those who, who did the reading. I'm not sure if everyone's done the reading yet, but this is really uh, complimentary. So this is session number seven, word studies. And it's also step number nine in the process. So I'll, I'll bring the process up later on so we can look at that, but it's a big process that, that we're working through. But I, I am trying to help us to see where we would put these different things that, that these different studies, how we would progress logically if we were to do these studies. And so uh, overview for tonight, the first thing we'll be doing is discussing word studies. What, what are they and how to do them? So I have a PowerPoint on just working through some of these ideas, and then we're going to apply it to Romans 1, 16 to 17. So what are they and how to do them? And then the second step is to apply them to Romans 1, 16 and 17. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's just uh, review the handout. I'm going to go ahead and bring up so you can see the, you can see the, full, the full picture here. Just coming back here and looking at the process. So we're still in that observation stage, but we're almost done. So, so we're really moving from the questions is up until the questions. It's almost, it's almost a place where we're just preparing ourselves. And then as we move from questions to observations and then on to word studies, now we're gathering information and starting to make decisions. Okay. So we're, we're, we're getting to a place uh, in word studies and, and structure analysis is where is really where you gather a lot of information and you really seek to answer different questions. And then explaining it is really synthesizing and writing out your thoughts in a concise method. So, so we've been gathering information, we've been doing a background study, a context study. So we'll be doing word studies. And then in the structure analysis, we're going to be really that last component of identifying different, identifying different things to then move into the uh, the exegetical outline and exegetical summary. So you, in, in the exegetical outline and the summary, you're already starting in some ways to put these things together. And then there's that transition into explanation. So by the time we're done this step, we should have gained and done most of our research. So, um, and, then, and then we'll be doing a synthesis or explaining it and then Really applying it is like preparing your sermon or preparing your, your lesson plan. You've already done all the work and now you're just, you're just applying what you've done. So purpose, what is the purpose for a word study or word studies? The purpose of a word study, sorry for the typo. The purpose of a word study is to try to understand as precisely as possible what the author was trying to convey by his use of a particular word in a particular context, or he says, use this word in this context. So you're trying to really identify what 
the author is, is saying and meaning. Now, I, I looked at several different books on their word study section, and they were a little deficient. So my, my only requirement for this class would, would to be to follow the basic pattern as laid out in grasp, grasping God's word. But I'm actually going to give you some other ideas to go deeper because I do feel that the word study that's laid out really in some ways is deficient. And I think when you look at Romans 1, 16 and 17, you'll understand how it's deficient. And I really haven't seen other people doing this. Some of these other ideas are not, they're original to me and I'm still trying to think through the terms. But I do feel that in some ways these word studies as described are deficient. And, and, and I want to kind of, draw us along. I think you'll see that as we work through here. So that's from Fee, New Testament, Exegesis. So, so this is the purpose. We're trying to understand what that word means. Definition. What is the definition of a word? A word is a verbal symbol, whether written or spoken, that offers a way to refer to a concept. And that's Blomberg, Handbook of New Testament Exegesis. So then Blomberg also gives several key aspects to consider as you're doing this word study there's several key aspects um number one most words have a range of meaning number two words can have a general meaning and a specific meaning to a particular context so words can both have a a, a general meaning that mean, that is that, that is they they just mean something generally and then they also have, they can also have a specific meaning in a particular group or context. So a perfect example, we could do, we could look at this, we could, we could look at this both positively and negatively. And so I'll just take one example. So for example, if you're using the word believe in a secular context, believe typically refers to simply the assent to a truth or reality, just you're accepting something is real, okay? And, and, and that's a legitimate meaning for belief. In a Christian context, it always has this trust. It means much more than that. So, that, so in a Christian context, belief, belief, belief means something different than in a secular context. Uh, you know, um, this is maybe more negative. I won't mention any words, but you, this is where we also have like crude or vulgar language, even profane language, okay? So there are some American words that you cannot say because it's, the word just means something, you know, but it, it's very offensive, okay? And in the Philippines, right? So, so in the U.S., we could say you're stupid and it's not so offensive, if you were to say you were stupid in the Philippines, it's highly offensive. You buy it's, it's incredibly high to call someone stupid. Maybe someone can correct me. In America, you can say you're you're dumb, and it doesn't. It, it it there's no there's nothing attached. You would use something else to be highly offensive, but the word in the Philippine context has a very a very uh, specific connotation to to a particular group or context. So that's something we have to understand and and, and, and contemplate. Uh, number three, individual words function with the rest of words in the context to express larger set of concepts. And this is really where I feel that, I really feel that the word study and the word studies descriptions fall short because they, they describe the word studies are set up only to look at a specific word, but, but most often a lot of words are in a phrase. It's not the word itself, it's in a phrase. So specifically, Pastor Henry brought up righteousness of God. We're going to be looking at righteousness, righteousness of God tonight. And uh, that's not a, you cannot go to a lexicon and look up righteousness of God. Okay. And so you can look up the word righteousness and you're going to see, we're going to see that that's really deficient. That's, you can look up the lexicon meaning of righteousness, but it's not dealing with that specific idea of righteousness of God. And so in some ways, there is a massive deficiency in word study. So I'm trying to expand. Again, this is not required. This is because it's still, I'm still thinking through this. But I'm trying to expand our studying of words, not just to a specific word, but to really like phrases, concepts, because that's typically, that's typically the case. And you'll see some other words, even some other words. It's just, again, 
you can look up the literal meaning and in doing the word study as they request, you don't actually succeed. You're still asking questions. And so I know I keep saying this, but once you see the examples, you'll really, you'll really understand what I'm talking about. And, and then lastly, priority must go to a word's meaning during the same time period. And so another mistake is that people will, will look at a word in all, they'll, 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 they'll look at the word across the, the entire scripture. And so they're trying to find meaning. So they're looking in the gospels. Then they're looking in the epistles. Then they're looking in the Old Testament. And maybe they're doing it in like in English. So they're looking at a word righteousness in English. And there's, there's a massive failure because you're looking at that word righteousness over 7, 000, several thousand years, right? The word of God has been written in for over several thousand years. And so you have to be very careful to not look at the Bible as just a set canon, just a set a, a point in time. It's, it's, it's over millennia. And so a word in the Old Testament might have, a word in the New Testament might have a fuller significance, a fuller meaning that it did not have in the Old Testament. And so again, that, that's, that's just something we need to be thinking about. You just can't blanketly look up a word all over all of scripture and just come up with the meaning, okay? And I think we all are in agreement with this. I'm just highlighting that. Let me, let me take a pause. Any questions or observations? Any questions or observations? Since the Bible was written in Hebrew in the Old Testament, then the time of uh, Jesus, it was in Aramaic. Now in Paul's time, in the New Testament, it's Greek. So in order to stand fully the word, so we have to learn Greek one, Hebrew one, yeah, a great question. So, so ideally, yes, if you're going to be a leader and an interpreter of the word, my recommendation would be for you to invest in the time in learning Greek and Hebrew. With that being said, you, if you can understand how Greek and Hebrew functions, there's you'll see tonight the Bible software. They get they do give tools for us to to identify words without without really understanding the language, as long as we understand how the language functions. And, and we'll, we'll do some, some practical examples. Uh, Kuya Bobo, go ahead. Uh, when we say word studies, are we actually studying the origin of words or uh, the, the composition of the word itself? Great, great question. So we are not studying, now, so, looking at how a word is uh you like the origin of a word the source of a word the context of a word that's called etymology word etymology okay that is one area that we can study but there's actual there's actually we have to be very careful because word etymology does not always help in the meaning of the word in a particular context so for example theop noustos uh, god breathed in, in uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, we should use word etymology to break down what that word means. Literally, God spirated. God, God, the word of God is God breathed. We just broke down the, two, the, the word into its, it's a compound word, and we're looking at it, okay? That would be an appropriate use. So, so, so in some instances, we would use it. In other instances, we should not. So it really is, it really is a case-by-case. Case. Yeah, and, and we'll, we'll look at that in a bit, but great, great question, great, great question. Uh, just to kind of get back on point, we're primarily looking at a word in context. So we're not studying word etymology. We would only be studying word et etymology in as far as it would help us in a meaning in a particular context. That's the extent, and that's coming from Lombard. Okay, tools. So what tools are we going to be using to, to study, to do this word study? Uh, again, because of the reading, I'm including the tools. You can use a lexicon. A lexicon just has the, the meaning, the meaning in the, uh, of the word, the Greek, the Hebrew, the Aramaic word. Uh, theological dictionaries, in some ways, get at more towards that direction that I've been referring to uh, that's moving beyond the word itself. They're looking at concepts, and so they are more helpful, although, again, we have to be careful with them because we're looking at a word in context. We're just not looking at the definition and, and choosing it. It has to be in, in the context. It's always in context. Words only have their full, precise meaning in a context. 
So I could say, I could say bank. I'll just ask the question so you can understand. I'm thinking of the word bank. What do I mean? In my mind, I'm thinking of the word bank. What, what do you think is in my mind? Money. Okay, so uh, Kuya Henry says money. Anyone else? Anyone else? Uh, water. Uh, water? What do you mean by water? Riverbanks. There you go, riverbanks. Anyone else? So, so actually, I was thinking of a riverbank. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I didn't, I didn't, that's really good, Queen Bullboy. But do you see, you're literally just guessing. You don't know. I mean, there's no context. There's, there's no context. I could say, I drove my car into the bank. And it could be, I drove it into the side of the river, or I, I drove my car into the bank. Now, okay, it's probably a river, right? So it's, it's, it's really in context. It's really in context. So we have to always be aware of that, okay? Um, <laughs> Here we go. The third is concord concordances. So these are really three tools, three tools that you can use. Now, now, uh, the blessing, the blessing. You don't need to buy these, these books because we have Step Bible. I will show you how to use this and there's no more need. You do not have to use, you don't have to buy money. You don't have to buy books. You don't have to buy these dictionaries. They're so expensive. Theological dictionaries are hundreds of dollars. I'm thinking of hundreds of dollars. There's one set that I, I purchased before. It was 250 US dollars. 250 US dollars. That's like, what was that, 12,000 pesos, something like that? It's crazy. So you don't have, we have Step Bible. You, you'll see the power. You'll see the power. Uh, so now we're going into word study. So these are kind of uh, dangers to be looking out for. These are caveats. Uh, pitfalls and word study fallacies. So this is something that we have to be on guard against. And so all of us have fallen into these traps. So we're all guilty. We all, when we point the finger, we've got the three coming back here. We've got the three coming back. So we're all, we're all guilty. English only fallacy, English only fallacy. What is this fallacy? It is, drum roll please. The English only fallacy occurs when you base your word study on an English word rather than underlying Greek in, in under the, the underlying Greek or Hebrew word. And as a result, it draws unreliable or misleading conclusions. Okay. So this is the reality. So ideally you want to know Hebrew and Greek. Uh, and if you can't know Hebrew, Greek, at least be, be aware that you're you're doing a word search of the greek word not the english word and I, again i will show you how to do this okay so never fear i will show you how to do this on step bible uh, and this is the power this is the power that we've been given uh, and so just to be very specific one hebrew or greek word can be translate translated using many different english words so if you're looking for a word in a book in, in an epistle, in a book, in a gospel, and you search the English word, you might not get all the references because that word could have a different translation in a different context. So you're automatically setting yourself up for failure. You're not going to get the whole, the, the big picture, okay? The, the other problem that we can have is that one English word can be used to translate several different Greek or Hebrew words. <laughs> so you can search that English word and you're actually getting several different Greek or Hebrew words. You, you don't realize that it, it's a different, if it's, 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 it's a different word. So, so again, and, and, and perhaps you're still being accurate because it's functioning as a synonym, fair enough. But we really have to be cautious in, in how we search. Uh, and just as I'm going to take a step back and just as a preface, this is, from the reading of Duval in word study. So I'm just, all of these citations are coming from Duval. I do want to give credit to him. I don't know if I cited him here, but this is, not, this is not original to me. Okay, so this is coming from Scott uh, Hayes and Duval on the Grasping God's Word, I believe second edition. So just again, just uh, a quick uh, note to who's, these are not my ideas here. You know, I agree with them. I agree with them 100%, but they're, they're not original to me. Uh, root fallacy. So this, this is the question that, that Bull Boy was asking. A root fallacy. This is a fallacy of breaking a word down into its parts to further clarify or define it. Word etymology often is used in this area. 
And so then I have a caveat. This is not to, the, to say that we should never consider the breakdown of a word. We, we can do it, but the context must support it. I would just really emphasize caution. I would emphasize caution here. Another thing to, another thing to think about is that looking at a root, when you're looking at specific, uh, so for example, in the book of Romans, I'll just give a quick example, book of Romans. Uh, the, the book of Romans is really set up in this judgment courtroom setting where God is the judge and he's, he's judging and going to mete out punishment. And so in this courtroom set setting, the, the righteousness, the, the root for righteousness, uh, you would get to justify, declare righteous, guilty, righteous, righteousness, unrighteousness. It's all coming from the same root, okay? And so when you actually search the root in Romans 1, uh, sorry, the whole book, the whole book of Romans, you really see that it's all over the place. That's the primary imagery that's going on in the, in the book of Romans, this courtroom setting uh, where God is the judge. So you would miss that if you did not do a, a root search, okay? So root searches can have benefits, but it, you have to be just so careful because, and so the classic example is uh, butterfly or uh, pineapple. We're looking at the word, at the word pineapple, right? Pinya pineapple in English. Pine and apple, two totally different ideas. You know, maybe perhaps when they first called it the, the pineapple, they were thinking it looks like a pine tree and it tastes like an apple. So they call it the pineapple. We don't, we don't know. But word etymology is not helpful, okay? So you just have to be careful. So when you're doing word studies, I would be hesitant to use I would say that don't go down this route until you become really good. I, I did not really travel down uh, word, uh, word etymology studies until I became more advanced. I, I would just say to stay away from that because it, it does take practice. Okay, time frame fallacy. So this is where I was saying we have to be care cautious. Uh, this fallacy occurs when we, when we latch a late date. So we, we attach a late a uh, word meaning and read it back into the earlier context. <laughs> so I'm going to give a word here and perhaps people will be like, I've done this. Okay. I've done this. Okay. So this is, you're taking a late meaning of a word and you're putting it back into the early. So it could be in English or it could be, so this is the word. If, if you've done this, we're all guilty. Okay. So don't, don't be ashamed. Maybe I should ask a hand. I should ask hands. So two, two examples. Uh, dynamite, <laughs> dynamite and martyr. <laughs> so for sure, we've all said like, we've looked at the word, Greek word, di, uh, dunamis, dunamis, uh, dunamis is the Greek word. And from dunamis through the centuries, we eventually came up with the word dynamite because dunamis means power and, and the actual physical dynamite has incredible power. Okay. But so what we've done is what, what some uh, pastors have done, done is they said, you know, think of the idea of, of dynamite. That's what Paul had in mind when he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation. He had dynamite in mind. And that's, that's we would call that an, an anachronism, an anachronistic, meaning to say that we're taking a late meaning and reinserting it. Paul had no clue. Okay, now for, for sure, he, he's saying that there's incredible power in um, the gospel. I'm not denying that. We can discuss that tonight, and you can see what kind of power it is. It's incredibly powerful. It's more powerful than dynamite. But it's just, it's not, it's not responsible reading the idea, the concept of dynamite back into duty. Is everyone tracking with me there? Uh, the other idea is, the other word, this is famous again, is martyr, right? So in our context, a uh, martyr means to be killed for your faith. And so the, the Greek word martus, martyreo, uh, marturion, which is for, uh, you're, you're hearing that same word mart there, the M-A-R. Okay, so you can have it in a verb, you can have it in a noun, you can have it in a, as a person in a noun, as a, as a, as a concept in a noun. So but, but people, will, people will look at martyr and talk about dying for the faith. But, but that was something that developed because so many did die for the faith. Martyr literally means to testify. A, mar, a, a, a martyr was someone who was a witness, literally witness. So you would, 
bear witness. This is a uh, uh, this is for this is for Koya Dan for Koya Bulboy. You would you would bear you would be a, a witness. You take the stand. You would bear witness. You would give a testimony. It, that's the idea. That's the root idea of martyr. And so eventually, because people would testify to the truth of the gospel, they eventually gave their lives. And now, if you say martyr, you're not thinking a law a, a courtroom setting. You're thinking of stop being a martyr. You know, like like you know, you're gonna die, right? It's a totally different context. 21st century is totally different. So, you, but you can't read that back into that when you see that word. Oh, it means this. We can't say that. It has a totally different context. And so those are two examples where you, you have to really look up the meaning in that specific time period. And we have to be hesitant to not import our uh, eisegete, our meaning back into the first century. Now, that's not to say that you can't look at something parallel in that original context and apply it, but it's, you're going the opposite way. You're looking at this meaning first in the first century, and then you're applying it. In, in our contemporary context versus taking our idea and then putting it back in. Okay. Is, is, is everyone tracking with, with me on that? What, what if the use of this kind of words are meant only for us a hyperbole? You're saying hyperbole and, and, and when you're teaching? And a might of other words that are so high uh, used in a different setting, but you want it to be overly emphasized in the present time setting. Yeah, you can, we can use hyperbole, but you can use hy hyperbole as long as you're working from this context into the present. You can, over, you can emphasize, that's fine. The key though is that we're not, we're not taking our context and reading it back into their context. Yeah, yeah that, that's the key. That's, that's really the key. So we can emphasize something. We, we can speak in hyperbolic, language but it's again coming from this to that we're, 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 we you have to have that trajectory that trajectory going from old into our context. okay um any other questions or comments okay uh next next the overload fallacy <laughs> i have a picture i have a picture i was so thinking about using it oh my goodness uh over <laughs> overload <laughs> The one thing that Filipinos love to do, Pastor Henry, you know this, overload size. <laughs> the truck is overloaded. We have to get it all on that one load, right? Concrete. I don't know how the trucks drive. I honestly don't know how they drive up the mountain. I, I can't imagine. I have a picture. I forgot. On the break, I'm going to find the picture. I'm going to show it to you. Second. Don't look. Don't look at the truck. It's it's quite big. Look at the motorcycle. Look at the motorcycle. Yeah, I'm over. Yeah, but Queen Bumboy, I'm afraid for the truck. The truck will run me over. <laughs> it won't stop. Overload fallacy. What is it? The overload fallacy is the idea that a word will. Uh, that a word will include all of the word sentences, senses every time that it is used. So you go and you gather all the different various meanings, and then you have your outline. Meaning one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> we got them all in there. You know, it, it, it's not. It's not going to. Ha it's that's not the case. Now there is. I don't want to say never, and there's a, there's, a, there's a few instances where all of the, maybe it's just so pregnant, it has all this big meaning. There's very few exceptions, if any. Uh, I'm thinking about one, but still, perhaps the idea of kingdom. So perhaps when, when, when Jesus comes on the scene and says, repent for the kingdom of the heavens is at hand, perhaps that can just be fully, it's like pregnant with just all the different meaning and nuances. It's more than just one area. So people reduce it down to one. I, I don't, I don't think that's appropriate. Um, you know, there's debate. So, but for the most part, taking all the different going and then writing out all the different meanings, that is a complete fallacy because 99% of the time, that's not the case. That's not the case. Now, I, I will give an example tonight where there's at least two meanings, okay? So it's not to say it's never the case, uh, and, and, but it is to say that it's not typically the case, okay? So we have to be very careful. We need to look for that word in that specific meaning. Word count fallacy. So this is 
if you're not sure, you're just gonna add up to see what the most, the, the most, what is used the most common, and then you just, you just use that, you just use that as the meaning. So we should not count up how many times a word has the same meaning and, and apply that most used meaning to a different context. This can be part of the proofs to prove a word's meaning, but it should not be the, but be solely the reason. So what this is saying is we just don't look at what is the most popular use. Oh, it must be this use. Now, word count is important because it does guard against someone coming up with a crazy meaning. So, for example, uh, the use of the word resurrection. Okay, so uh, resurrection almost always, if not always, refers to physical resurrection. So there's there's a, de a highly debated passage of scripture in Revelation where people will say it means it's not literal it's in a figurative sense and so people will say that um, you have in every other instance this physical usage you need to have a really strong case that it doesn't mean so they're they're taking the word count and they're saying you have to look at this all this other way to say that it doesn't mean it so fair enough so it can guard against that but you shouldn't as a rule of thumb just count up what's the most popular and then choose that meaning that's that's not wise unless it's like 99% it's always used in this context and then you have the next context and you're like, okay, it has to be this, you know, fair, fair enough. But for the most part, you just shouldn't be counting and then, and then choosing. Word concept fallacy. This is a fallacy that occurs when we assume that we understand a concept after studying one word that the concept describes. So one example is this idea of ecclesia. So people will just look at the word ecclesia and they say, I understand the context. Okay. Uh, that, that would be a word concept fallacy. You're just looking at a concept typically has more than one. It's, it's, it's a, mul a concept is a multi-dimensional uh, construct. Okay. So to say it's just one word, it's, your, it's not one dimensional. Most concepts, if not, if all of them aren't one dimensional. So you do have to be careful. So a big, so here's a big one. And, and so it works multiple ways. This idea of salvation. People will reduce salvation down to one concept, right? That is spiritual eternal salvation, okay? Spiritual eternal salvation. But I just posted two weeks ago on the EBST group page, right? Um, by guarding the teaching and watching the teacher, you will save both yourself and your hearers. First Timothy four, I believe, eighteen. Okay, you will, you will, you will save yourself and your hearers. Now, in guarding the teaching and guarding the, the teacher, is Timothy literally saving them from eternal damnation? <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> but. But in that context, it's a reference to a, a, a physical form of salvation, that you're going to protect the church from destruction. You're going to protect from apostasy. You're going to protect from big problems in the church. Maybe you're going to protect from falling into sin. The, the, the idea of salvation is not always in an eternal eschatological context. So that, this would be a word concept where I just I have one concept for one word, and that's it. Salvation in the Old Testament can often be just temporal. It, it's not eternal eschatological. When I say eschatological, it's a big word, but it's like end time. It's, it's uh, apocalyptic. It's like the end time eternal context, okay? So salvation is a big word. It's multidimensional. Go ahead. Go ahead. Do you have uh, a list of words that uh, throughout time that meaning has never changed? And uh, similarly, are there words that ever since that word came out, people have not accepted the same meaning as they were before? No, I, would, I, would, I would say pretty definitively there's no, there's no word. If you, if you had a word like that, I would like to know it. Because typically words, words have like the literal meaning at the very beginning of time. And then that develops into multi-levels of meaning. There's, there's a physical act that, that goes on into figurative senses. So I'm going to kill you, right? Kill is literal like patai, but, but now we say I'm going to kill you in a, in a very figurative context, you know? Um, so I'm fighting, I'm fighting with my wife. I mean, I'm not, 
I'm not punching her, right? I'm just, we're arguing. So, so yeah, I, I don't think there's any example of any word that has just had that static meaning from the beginning of time. There, there's no word, there's no word. What about sin? Sin, the word sin. 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 Yeah, even looking at the word sin in today's context, people have different meanings for it. So it's meaning has changed over. The original, one of the original meanings for sin is to miss the mark. It's this archery term where you're, you're actually missing the mark of the archery. But you ask people today and they would rarely, they would, you know, it's transgression against God. It's, it has just a host of different meanings. So, yeah, but, but it's because words change in context. It's always in context. There is this core meaning and then it's being used in different contexts and then that changes over time. I would say this, I would say this, Koi Boy. typically it's not that it's changing meaning but that the meaning is growing. We could say the meaning would be, it, it's becoming fuller. As people use it in different contexts, the, the meaning actually expands. And, and I think that's a fair, the core meaning is there, but, it, but the meaning is expanding. Maybe that's a better description. Great question, that, that's really very thoughtful. Okay, um, selective evidence fallacy. <laughs> selective evidence fallacy. This is when, we selectively choose evidence by selecting some evidence and ignoring other evidence in order to prove our meaning or interpretation. And so this happens a lot. I'm thinking of some passage, passages of scripture where people will, they just will disregard it because it doesn't fit within their theological construct. Um, maybe, I, maybe I'll step, step on some toes here, but this idea of like election, election people will say, you know, oh, only, you know, I'm not a Calvinist, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a biblicist, you know, I only use the word of God, I don't use terminology like election, and, and my response is, well, it's biblical, it's literally, election is, is literally to choose, so, um, so people, people look at this idea of elect, and they don't see it in scripture, because there's other words, but the original Greek, uh, it, it's, it's there, it's, <laughs> It's, it's, it's in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So my, my response is always, well, it's, it's biblical. It's just, how do you define election? How do you define being chosen by God? Okay, so, so that would be an example where, where, where some people are just very much against a, a particular theological construct. And so they're actually, it's causing them to actually ignore biblical language and terminology. So, so, the, so the, big, the big thing here is that when we, when we see something that doesn't fit our theology, our first response shouldn't be to immediately defend, but our first response should be to gather information to really investigate. And if, and if we can't find a solution, we need to expand our theology or modify it instead of selecting <laughs> to ignore it. I had one person say, there are some really hard things in Hebrews. We, we, don't need to, we don't need to study those things. I was like, it's the word of God. What do you mean? We have to study it. It's part. It's the word of God. So, Okay. Uh, watch out for transliterated words. So the last warning I'm going to make is that make sure that you are investigating and, and explaining to your audience when transliterated words are used or present. And so the biggest transliterated word is Christ. Christ is anointed one or messiah literally the anointed one of god um, and so that had great implications concerning the prophetic concerning the kingly and concerning the priestly function and so this idea the the, the christ the son of the living god um, christ is transliterated it's a transliterated word and so it becomes christianese but there's a lot of transliterated words that we need to be explaining and teaching um, need to be explaining and teaching. Um, just so everyone's clear, a transliterated word is where you take the original word in Hebrew or Greek and you just transliterate it. So you take the sounds and then you write it in, the, in, in your language. So for example, in Tagalog or waray waray, bicicleta, bicicleta is bicycle. It's transliterated. You, you borrowed you borrowed a English word bicycle and you transliterated it into Tagalog. Uh, cell phone, <laughs> cell phone. <laughs> that's cell phone, that's transliterated, cell phone. Um, 
uh, education, education, right? That's education. So you're, 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 you're borrowing an English word and, and, I, and, and it's Spanish too. So maybe Sp Spanish is also borrowing the word, but, but, but regardless, you're just borrowing that word and then you're transliterating it into, um, into, your, into your language. Procedure. So this is the procedure given by Duvall. We're going to follow it, and then I'm going to maybe add uh, add a little bit to it once we do the example, so you can see. So, uh, and I might create a handout if I have time. I might create like a handout for you, but um, no promises. So you need to take notes here. Um, number one, identify the semantic range of word. That is identify the different legitimate possible word meanings that your word could mean. And so you, you use a lexicon. So here you're going to use a lexicon. We're going to use Step Bible. And you're going to list the legitimate different word possibilities. Now, we're not using words that are almost like synonyms. We're not going to create two different words if they're like synonyms. We're using two legitimately different uh, meanings. Okay? Oops. Number two, we're gonna use Step Bible to do this. So we'll, we'll use Step Bible to, to do the original Greek or Hebrew. And then number three is we're going to examine the context to see how the word um, uh, is used, okay? So really, majority of our proofs, we're going to use a concordance, again, Step Bible, and then find out all the other usages of that word. And, and I'll, give you, I'll give you a level, you're gonna see in a moment, the priority of what words are, are take higher priority, take higher precedent. And so we're just going to look at how this word is used in the cl next closest context, the next closest context, the next closest context, and we're just going to, to look at how it's used, and then we're going to have to make a decision, okay? And so the most important context is the sentence, the sentences surrounding that word. So I have a priority list here for you. I have a priority list here for you. Oh, there's one more. And lastly, you're going to choose. So you're going to choose the best meaning and provide, provide several reasons for your choice. So we, we, I have not yet assigned you. I'll probably assign you tonight assignment number six. Assignment number seven, we'll be doing a word study on your passage where you're going to choose several words that you want, or words or phrases that you want to study. And then I'm going to ask for at least three reasons. So you're going to choose the, the, the word possibilities legitimate word possibility so it'll be it'll be two or three then you're gonna you're gonna research it then you're going to give me the, the choice that you selected but then you're going to give me three reasons why you chose it three reasons why you chose it okay so this is this is the the level everyone can see that just imagine the colors are going from hot to cold so that's the color, going from hot to cold, okay? So the word itself contains a meaning, okay? The next, the, the, the next place that you go, once you have the list of possible meanings, the next place that you're going to go to is not going to go to a concordance, not going to go to somewhere else. You're going to go to the immediate context. The immediate context is going to give you the best clues as to what the author meant. So maybe this is a little bit hard to see, I'm sorry. So it's... Uh, immediate context would be the next closest. Okay, so your 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 next closest is immediate context, and then once you looked at the immediate context, and that's not so helpful. Some people will say broader context, or we could say the context of the book. So you're going to search for that word throughout the rest of the book that you're studying. Okay, you're going to look to see if that author used that word in any other. Uh, verses or passages and you're going to, to compare the two is it the same is it different how is he using it and then if and then after that you're going to go to if if the author has multiple works you're going to go to the author's other works the context of author's works so paul you have a lot to work from paul you have a lot to work from uh, the apostle john you have a lot to work from the Pentateuch, you have a lot to work from moses wrote five books uh jude <laughs> Young. You have one. You have one. Okay. And then once you're outside, once you've looked at the context of the author's other works, then you're going to go to other writers, similar genre, similar topic. Okay. So for example, Jude only has one book. 
but you have Second Peter, you have First Peter. Second Second Peter is very close to Jude. So right there, you can go ah, you you just tripled or quadrupled your your information because Peter, in many ways, is very similar to Jude. And then if you don't, if if beyond those uh, other writers with similar genre, similar topic, you're going to go to similar time period. So the epistles are essentially all the same time period. Even you could say the New Testament is the same time period. It's within 30, 40 years. It's rel relatively the same time period. Um, the Pentateuch, same time period. But the prophets are much later. The prophets are much later from, from the, the Pentateuch. We're taking a conservative interpretation. So, so you have to be careful reading the prophets and reading Moses. The prophets are a different time period than the law. Okay. The Old Testament is a way different time period compared to the New Testament. Evaluating context questions. So, so here are some questions to, to, to think about, to contemplate as you're looking at the context. Number one, is there a contrast or a comparison that seems to define the word? So you're looking, is it the same? Is it different? Is it complementary? You're looking for a relationship here. How is this being used compared to that? Maybe it's the same. Maybe it's, maybe it's exactly the same. So you want to be thinking about that. Does the subject matter or topic of a passage dictate the word's meaning? So looking at the broader topic or subject matter, could clearly, does it clearly dictate what that word means? Uh, thinking about Romans 1, 16, 17, the broader context clearly defines salvation for us. It clearly defines it. We're going to look at that. Both in examples and both the larger topic itself will define salvation. It will define gospel. It even defines power. So many times, many times uh, it's this, this larger topic, this larger context that's really going to, to clarify. So that's, that's, again, why it's important that I wanted you to read through the book before you, before you did the study. So you really get an idea of what the topic is, what the content is. That's why it's really important. Does the author's, use, does the author's usage of the same word elsewhere in a similar context help you decide which meaning best fits the word? So you want to be thinking about the author's usage elsewhere. Okay, the author's, now that we're looking at the author's usage. How, how does the author often use this word? This is, this, is more a, this is more a thinking, critical thinking question. Does the author's argument in the book suggest a meaning? So looking at the argument itself, is the argument itself pointing towards a meaning? And then does the historical situation tilt the evidence in a certain direction? So again, this is why a background study is so critical. We're, we're, it, it, the background study, the context study is setting us up to be in a great position to make these identifications, to make these conclusions. Okay, so this is, you know, no doubt you've been like, Tim, I'm, you, you made me do so much and I'm so tired and this and that. Well, this is why the, the better you are at, your, at the background and the context study, the better place you'll be in to make these type of decisions. Tim, while they are waiting, uh, what if you are looking at the word only in its literal meaning? Do you need to evaluate the word in this, in this, uh, in this context? So a word study is always in context. So it's always in context. Now, looking at it outside would be like philo philosophical. <laughs> now you're going into philosophy. But in philosophy, they're still looking at context to develop the idea. So it, it, they're still looking at, it's always in context. Yeah, great question. Okay, let's go on. Okay, so advanced word study. So in some ways, I felt that it's, I mentioned before that the word study is deficient. And, and I think in our example, you'll see why. And so I just wanted to find, there's three type of word problems. So I'm expanding. I'm expanding this word study to actually three different types. You don't, this is not required. So this is extra credit if you want to go. This is, this is going deep, okay? So you will see, stick around tonight, you will see deficiencies when we look to, when we, when we go to the lexicon, when we go to the dictionary and try to find the meaning of, let's say, 
salvation. You're going to see what it means, and you're going to be sorely disappointed because it's not going to answer the theological questions that we were asked. Okay, so what, so there's several different layers of questions types of problems that we want to investigate. Number one, this is essentially what we just described, word meaning. So what we're describing in word meaning, that's what we're dealing with. It's that literal meaning of the word itself. Okay? It's, it's just one word. Okay, that, That's what we've just unpacked. And then I'm adding two others. I'm adding two others for it. Okay, so But, but in the procedure, if you were to pursue this, this, you would first ask the question, what kind of problem am I pursuing? Am I just pursuing a word problem, uh, a word meaning, or am I pursuing something else? So, so the, second, the second is word referent. Word referent, again, maybe the word is weak. I'm thinking about a word to describe, but sometimes the question does not deal with, uh, does not deal with the literal meaning of the word, but what the word is referring to. So that's where I get the word referent. So, for example, the question of salvation, is it physical, is it eternal, uh, what, is the, what are we being saved from? That's a question that a word meaning would, does not answer. It doesn't answer it. So, the word referent is a slightly different uh, uh, problem that we're seeking to discover. So, I'm, I guess I'm trying to set us up going down the right path. I, I think it'll make more sense when we do it examples. But so that's the, that's, that's the, that's the, um, the second. So you have word meaning, then you have word reference. And then the third is word content. So word content, this is more with a phrase or a concept. So, so for example, again, you're going to, to see this um, in, in, in the next hour. But what does that word or concept mean? What is the full definition of, of that word or concept that the author is referring to? Uh, thinking about... Let's take, for example, the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. When you, we're going to see this in the next period. Gospel just literally means good news or glad tidings. And so what is, what is the word meaning of gospel? Good news. That doesn't help. <laughs> that doesn't help. What is the gospel? Your, your question still stands. What is the gospel, right? Simply going to the lexicon is not going to give you the answer. And so that's why um, sometimes you need just to go to that word meaning. But, it, but, it, but uh, for example, we'll see another word where we're just looking at that word meaning. We're looking at belief and we're looking at that word meaning. But with the gospel, we're looking at the full content. What is, when Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, what is the full content that he's referring to? Gospel. And so there we're looking at this concept. We're looking at a definition beyond but then the lexicon isn't going to help us as much. We're going to have to look at the context to see how Paul defines the gospel. Okay, so this is where word meaning or a word study will really fall short. You will, you will be disappointed because there's a lot of other tangential questions that the word meaning doesn't get at. Okay, and so we're really we're adding additional investigations that we can go to really be getting to significance. Is everyone tracking with me there? Okay, so I just have, I'm just going to repeat the definitions for these, uh, these, these three different concepts. So word meaning is just a standard word study. So word meaning, think standard word study. Word referent is other tangential aspects in relationship to the words meaning that are important. So it could be antecedent. What is the antecedent? Uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you are saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves the gift of God. What is the word this referring to? Is it referring to faith? Is it referring to salvation? Is it referring to salvation through faith? So just defining this is not helpful. You have to go to a word, a word reference uh, investigation to, to really uncover that meaning. And then word content is what the full meaning of the word or the theological concept that the author is referring to. Okay, so that's 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 the uh, that the handout for that's the PowerPoint. Let's take a ten minute break. All right, so this is the uh, this is the passage of scripture, Romans 1, 16 and seventeen. And so what we're going to do now is I'm going I'm going to just look at we're going to look at four four. 
four words and look at the look at different problems and try to solve the problems okay so the first word i'm going to look at is gospel the second is salvation the third is belief and then the fourth is righteousness of god okay and i think here we're going to really see that if if you just explore righteousness, it's going to be deficient. So what we'll do is we're just going to work. We're just going to go step by step. So, and then we'll just work through the process. So as if I, I have a pen and paper, I'm working through this with you. Okay. So let's just look first at number one. Let's look at this idea of gospel. So what I want to do is I want to ask the number one question. what to study okay so we have several options here i can do a i can do the possibilities are word meaning number 2 it could be a a reference and then number 3 it could be a content I need to make a decision which direction I'm going to go, okay? So let's go ahead. So my first step is I'm going to go to number, so I shouldn't say first step. So the first step is identifying the word. The next step is I'm going to go to step Bible. So I'm going to go now to step Bible to see what's going on, just to see, just to, to, to see what, to see what I can see. So I'm gonna to go to Step Bible. So when I bring up Step Bible, it looks like this. So what I'll do is I'm gonna just go to the first one here. I'm going to X off Genesis and I'm going to type in uh, Romans 1, 16 to 17. So everyone sees that, right? Everyone sees that option. I'm going to select, I'm not gonna press enter. I'm gonna select on the Romans 1, 16 to 17. So I selected on the option that came up below. That's the critical thing. Before entering, you have to see the option that, that, that pops up and then you have to click on it. So let me do that again, okay? I'm gonna, I'm gonna mark off that X. So watch, I'm gonna click. I'm just typing on that section there and I'm gonna type in Rome, uh, one colon 16 hyphen 17. So that gives me my passage. And then see that Romans 1, 16 to 17. So I, I just clicked on it. I just tapped on it, okay? So now, and now I'm going to X out. I'm going to go ahead and X out on the right side. So, so, so there's my passage, okay? There, there's my passage. Everyone can see that. On, on the left side here, you have cross references. And then you have a text here. Now, if you notice here, you have some different color texts, okay? You can click on those texts. You can click on them to get information. So what I'm going to do now is we're going to investigate the word gospel. Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm going to click on that word. Okay, so now at the bottom of the screen, I get, I get, some, I get some definitions. Everyone sees the, the definitions. So I'm going to click on it again. I'm gonna double click on it. Okay, so now it pops up on the right portion of my screen. See that here? Now it's on the right portion. I'm just using my tablet, okay? So looking here now, look, look at the meanings here, okay? Look at those meanings, okay? I, I see glad tidings, I see good, I see joyful news, and that's pretty much it, right? So you see gospel good news, okay? Let's, let's just come back here, okay? So to a word meaning, there's really only this idea of gospel, Good news, glad tidings. So do you see how, do you see how in one sense you're let down? <laughs> My question is what is the gospel, right? So, so the question I wanna ask is because, so we, we could sit now after looking at Step Bible, I could, I could ask the question,
doesn't, doesn't answer the question, right? This here doesn't answer the question. Going to the lexicon doesn't solve the problem. Is everyone tracking with me? Everyone sees that? All it does is just further, that's what the word literally means. Good news, glad tidings. So in this case, this is not helpful for us. When I go back to look at the options, I think this is going to be more helpful. If you go back to your notes, I can go to my notes. This is, what is the full meaning? So I'm actually thinking about this is going to be more helpful because even the referent, what is referent? We don't, we're not interested in referent, right? Necessarily. So then coming to here, what is the problem I'm going to pursue? What, what, what is, what is, I'm going, I want to identify the word content. What is this full meaning of this word? I want the full meaning of gospel. Word meaning is not going to help me. Word, a word content investigation is. Okay, so then I choose. So you could say, looking at the, the problem, you could say, what's, what's, the, what's, what's the type of study I'm going to do? I'm going to do a word content study. Everyone tracking with me? So we're making, we, you have to kind of assess. This here is the lexicon. This here is the lexicon. It's also the dictionary. It's also the dictionary, right? So this here doesn't, it does help to find gospel. So let me just be clear. If I'm preaching, I would still want to define gospel literally means good news, okay? So I'm not saying we should not include that in the application. People need to understand it's good news. But when you're trying to really define gospel, it's not actually very helpful. Okay, everyone's tracking with me. What are we going to do? <laughs> what are we going to do? We're, we're caught. But we have a solution. So if you noticed before, we talked about a concordance. A concordance gives you all the different references. So at this point, the next step is, what I would say is the next step is we're going to do the word content and then, and then number five. I want to look at all uses of gospel in Romans to see if it is defined. Okay, I want to look at that. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to come back here. This is where pen and paper, you need to write this down. Okay, so watch. I'm going to click on this again. And if you look over here, it's going to say gospel. And then it actually has the English word. That middle word is actually the transliteration. Euangelion. Euangelion is the transliteration. Okay, everyone sees that? So I'm actually going to go up to here, and I'm going to X this out, and I'm going to type in, you see that? You see how now gospel came up, but you're not searching the English word, you're searching the Greek word. You don't know Greek. That's fine. You're just matching. You see that transliterated word there. Everyone's tracking with me? It's very easy. So I'm just going to click. So now I am searching every use of that word euangelion in the New Testament. So we have Matthew 4.24, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Ah, wow, gospel of the kingdom. Again, 9.35, gospel of the kingdom. Matthew 24.14, the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed to the whole world. Uh, 26.13, the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world. So look, we're, we're getting so many different references. Ah, there's a lot of Romans here. But remember, I said, I want to look in Romans. Remember our, our, our circle? We're going to Romans. We're going to the immediate context. So I'm going to further narrow my search. So I'm going to come back up to here. Now, look, I'm, I'm going to type, I, I type Romans. So I click Romans here. And now I'm going to click on it. Now I'm limiting my search to Romans. <laughs> Do you like that? Look how easy that is. No need for a concordance. No need to go by. Burn your concordances. If you have one, you don't need it. Well, actually, don't do that because maybe there's a brown out. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Wow. Look at this. Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Romans 1.9. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, 
without ceasing to mention, I mention you. Romans 1.16 is our passage. Romans uh, 2.16. On that day when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men and of Jesus Christ. 10.16. But they have all... <laughs> it doesn't say believe. What does it say? They have not all obeyed the gospel. Wow. That might actually help us define faith. That might help us define faith, Mama Ya. Because in a negative context, it's not, they have not all dis disbelieved. It's they have not all obeyed the gospel. God doesn't just offer the gospel. He commands everyone to believe it. That's powerful. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. So these are the references, okay? Now, we don't have time to really go into each one of these. What I would do is, for trying to define the gospel, I would actually go into each context to read. So I want to look at Romans 1.1, 1, 1 because I'm kind of cheating. But I would, look, I would look at the broader context of each one of these to see what else is being said around there. So let's go, let's go to Romans 1. I, I'm, I'm going to cheat because I've, I've already done this. I'm going to go to Romans 1, 1 to 5. Because I, I know it's going to be good. I've already checked. I know it's going to be good. So I have to X this off. Uh, just imagine you're certain. These are like tags that you're searching. Okay. So now I have, now I have Romans, uh, one, one to Romans one one to one five. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the holy scriptures concerning. So what's this good news about? It's concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace, apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among the nations. So this is actually a pretty good description of the gospel. It concerns Jesus Christ his death and resurrection, and it's, we've been given this grace and apostleship for the purpose of the obedience of faith. So this passage helps define what the gospel is. Is everyone tracking with what we're doing here? Now, I, I do want to say something else. In, in, in this word here, what you can actually do, and I'd recommend, is I would look at every single reference, if you have time to really define that. And we've done this before in studies. If you're taking my other class, we've done this already. I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians because this was one of the options that popped up. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. So when I click on 1 Corinthians 1 to 4, because the gospel is there, you see it in verse 1. When I look at this context, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you had believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, in accordance with the scriptures that he was buried, he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Pastor Henry, remember, we, we discussed this in Christianity 101. We've also uh -huh. discussed this in the, the Bible's big story. You buy others, others. Mm -hmm. when, when I do my gospel search and, and I look at each passage, I look at this passage and, and this is the clearest reference of what the gospel is concerning us and our response to the gospel. So even though this is not in the context of Romans, I, I, you can choose this passage because it really, it, it really defines what the gospel is. Now, after looking at this passage, we can go back and we can actually identify the gospel in Romans, in Romans chapter 3 and Romans chapter 5. Is everyone tracking with what we're doing here? Any questions? Is it making sense? I'll just do it one more time so you, so you can see, okay? So what I'm doing here is... This toggle bar here, you see this bar there? Th that bar allows you to type in different tags by which you will search. I'm going to type in Romans 1, uh, Romans 1, 1 to 5, okay? Now watch, watch. You're not going to just press enter. You have to click, you see in red Romans 1, 1, you see the red there or just below it? You yeah. have to click on that so that it then comes up to, it, it comes up. Okay. 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 You have to click. So, 
when there's a drop down toggle, then there's different options. Then you have to click. You don't press enter. If you press enter, you're gonna mess it up. It's gonna give you an error. That's to, what I think. Yeah. Okay. And then once you once you type in, so once you type in, then you can also type in, then you can click the search button. There's a search button on the right there. So I'm gonna type in this word for gospel. So I have to wait. Now you see the options, okay? So now I'm going to click on the green. I'm not going to press enter. I'm gonna click on the green okay. and it gives all the different options. So then watch this now. I'm gonna change this. I wanna do this in, in Revelation. Is there any reference to gospel in Revelation? So I'm going to type in rev. Just wait, and then I'm just clicking on the top option, Revelation of John. So there's one reference. Okay, so it's really, you have to wait, and then it'll drop down, and then you'll have different options, and then you can, uh, and then it'll automatically go, okay? And, and then you also want to click, you want to click on just, just tap it, just tap it here, and then you have that on the right side. Now, this is something really powerful, so watch this. I can also add N I V. Boom. So now you have two, they're next side by side, so it's very powerful, okay? So I, I'm gonna do three. I wanna do K J V, and I can still search, so I'm gonna search here nation. There it is, nation. So what I hope you can see here is this is your lexicon, this is your dictionary, and then this is also your concordance all in one. Okay, now, so let's, let's, let's come back to our, our passage here. I, I'm, I'm working through the process. So then the next step here is what I'm going to say is, I'm going to say is, So we can call this word possibilities. This is like range of meaning. What, what is the range of meaning here, okay? So we've, we've seen what, how Paul defines the gospel. Paul defines the gospel in, uh, in Romans 1, 1 to 5. He defines it in 1 Corinthians 15. Looking at 1 Corinthians 15, and then we go back to Romans, we can see it in Romans 3, 21 to 26. But what I want us to see here is that when we're looking for different possibilities now, in word meaning, you're going to use the lexicon, okay? In word meaning, you're going to lose lexicon. For word content, you can either use commentaries, you can even use your context. When I preach, have preached this before, what I would say to myself is, how do people define the gospel? Not how do I define it, what's the proper definition? How do other people define the gospel? So this is in some way getting a little applicational but I want to list those different definitions. Number one, to draw my definition into better clarity. And then number two, to really have the, how, people, how people understand the, the, the gospel. So I actually thought about what are some, def, how do people define the gospel? Does anyone, these are not right answers, okay? So how has a person defined the gospel in a Filipino what are, what are context? How have they defined the gospel in the past? Does someone want to give me a, a stat? These would be a wrong or an incomplete answer. Maybe in the past, uh, in the Catholic Church, it's, it's what's being said during the Mass. Ah, and so. not, really, uh, not really understanding what's re that it is really a good news. And then, and then when the priest said, this is the gospel of our salvation, it's not fully understood. It's like it's just part of a ritual or a ceremony. But when I became a Christian, and whenever I hear the the mass, uh, I I appreciated it. I appreciated it much because when he said that Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again, and the gospel is preached like that one. I guess that's how they understood about gospel. Yeah, so th there's partial truth in that, right, P Pastor Edwin? Because Paul does say when we take the Lord's, Lord's Supper, whenever we take this, we, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So there's a partial truth there. But the gospel, it's more in the taking of the Mass. It's the taking of the Mass 
where that's the good news, right? In, in, in the taking of the sacrament, is that what you're trying to get at? It's more of the taking of the sacrament? That is yes, yes. Yeah. So, so, but that's a great, so here we can define it how people understand it because you want to answer, you want to give the clarification. So that's one way. Excellent. That's, that's an excellent way that people have wrongly defined the gospel. What's another way that people have wrongly defined the gospel? Maybe they would say they rightly were wrong. Fair enough. <laughs> but but wh how else? How else have they defined the gospel? What, whatever the message of the priest say in the homily, that is to be the gospel for the day. Uh, for others, they believe that their gospel is that becoming a member of the church. Excellent. Excellent. In, in, in a U.S. context, this is a U.S. liberal context, the, go the gospel is Jesus' example for us to follow. The gospel is only, is only the example that Jesus gave us to follow. So, it's, so when, we, when we see Jesus' example and then we follow him, that's the good news. Uh, someone was asking me that gospel means needs you need to be baptized to be saved. So okay, good. So I'm trying to think how I can word that. The gospel is. Um, so we could say the response to the gospel is bat. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think how we could say that. I, I I agree with what you're saying. I'm think I'm thinking how we can word that. The gospel is in order to be saved there's a need for you to be baptized. Someone is claiming that. Yeah, no, okay, gotcha. So give me one second here. Yeah, so I can, we can say, um, yeah, so, so we have five. We have five here. And, and you could name more. You don't have to keep going on in infinitum. This is an area where you, you kind of do need to know your context. You need to know those in your church. I think this is, this is a good range of meaning. And so here, you know, looking at how they define it, um, I'm just going to put here, the clearest example is, is, is uh, 1, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. Um, and, and we could write it out. Let me see what I had here. I had, uh, so I, I, so I clearly define it. So looking at first Corinthians 15, one to four, and then also Romans three, 21 to 26. So I, I cheated. Okay. This is, so this is part of your investigation. So here you're looking at these parallel contexts in your study. So this is part of the studying process, but so looking at first Corinthians 15, one to four, Romans three, 21 to 26, and also Romans 1, 1 to 5, my definition is, uh, my definition is the good news is that God justifies us through our faith in Jesus who bore our sins on the cross, absorbing God's wrath that was due us and giving us his righteousness. So that's how I define the gospel. So let me just write that out really quick. Now, in, in the technical, most fundamental se sense, the good news is that God sent his son to earth to die on the cross, to pay the penalty of our sins, to make, to make God favorable to us and to cancel our sins, and then to give us his righteousness. Okay, so, so I do want to be clear. The, the gospel is not what we do. So the gospel most fundamentally, according to Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4, is the work of Christ. And then we respond to the gospel. We receive it, 
We cling to it. We stand on it. We proclaim it. We are being saved by it. Okay, so I want to be very specific. Now, I have included the idea of our response because in one sense, it's truly good news if we are, if we are partaking in it. But in, in a technical sense, I, 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 in a technical sense, the gospel, we don't do anything for the gospel. The gospel is what God has done for us in Christ. Okay, I want to be very specific on that. Now, with that, okay, and then our response, that's why I really think that 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4 is important. But going to Romans 1, 1 to 5 and going to Romans 3, 21 to 26, it, it also defines in the same way that 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4 does. So if I'm preaching this sermon, you know, and I'm defining the gospel, Henry, Henry, you remember when, when, we, when we had the class, right? Mm hmm Yeah. We went to 1 Corinthians 15 because it's so specific. You can't. Yeah, it's specific. It must be. And it's not that Romans is not. Ro Romans is more comprehensive, but Romans is also more detailed. And so it depends. It depends on your context. If you really have the time, define it in Romans. But if, you're, if, you're, if, if you don't have the time, you can also go to Corinthians 15. It's the same author. It's the same truth. Okay, but you have to be specific. So then, so then my, um, um, so then this is the word possibility. So then in the process, technically speaking, you would then go to which, which one and why. So of course, you're going to choose this one, right? You're going to choose this one. So that's the right answer. This is the right answer. And then what I typically will do is, uh, in, this, in the homework, you're going to have to do this. You need to give uh, one, two, three reasons why. This is, th these are your whys or your proofs. This proves this helps, you, this helps you to think critically. So your offering, your answer is gonna go right here. This is going to be your answer, which would just be here. And then you're gonna do, you're gonna do three proofs at least, okay? So let me look at my proof here for the gospel. So I have, I have my proof here. So I have a broader context proof. So you could say broader context. You could say Romans context. In the succeeding context, the author declares that God justifies us by our faith through redemption that is in Christ. Romans 3, 22 and 24. So I'm literally just going to quote and explain. I'm going to, I'm going to explain this. That's a proof. Okay. Uh, number two, a broader context proof. In the succeeding context, the author declares that God, Christ was put forward as a propitiation. Propitiation is defined as both a cancellation of sin debt and the appeasement of the anger, angry, the anger of a deity. This indicates that the purpose of the work of Christ, which is good news, is the payment of our sin debt. So again, I'm using in a slightly different way. I'm again using Romans 3.21 26 again okay so you can you can you can you're looking at the broader context for proofs for why you chose what you chose is everyone tracking with me now again this is more deep because romans 1 16 to 17 is so foundational okay so i want to emphasize that your proofs won't be this deep they they might not be this difficult um you know i'm just yeah it's not, it's not going to be as difficult as this. This is a, a more challenging passage. Any questions or comments, or is that making sense? Now, now, it might seem like a lot, fair enough, but in some ways, you're also setting yourself up. You're, you're, you're setting yourself up to make easy application, to make easy illustrations once you preach or once you teach this, okay? So in some ways, this is the, you're, you're actually, as you're working through the process, you're setting yourself up. Um, and the other thing I want to say is that you know, sometimes when I preach, I don't have time to do all of this. And so what I'm doing is I'm still thinking through this in my mind, even though I'm not doing all these steps. 
And so my desire in doing the process is that you at least think through the process. Let's go to the next one. So now let's go over here to beliefs. So now we're going to look at this word belief, right? We, we want to, we want, we talked about this before. Just looking at this word, Uh, several things that came to my mind is number one, we wanted to look at the relationship here, right? That from, from last week, if you remember last week, we want to see is faith the same? Is it different? And we also wanted to ask the question, what is the relationship between these, right? So, we, so what I want to do here is I want to, I'm just thinking, I'm shooting from the hip. I want to, I want to do a word meaning. because I want to define this because belief is always abused. And then, so that's, so that's one. And then number two is, this would be like, uh, is, I'm just gonna write out the question that I'm investigating. Is belief I'll just write this more clear. Is belief synonymous? with faith. So those are two questions going into what I'm going to be looking for. Okay, those are two questions. All right. So let's go back to step Bible. So we're going to go back to step Bible. I'm going to X out of these. So I'm going to go back to Romans 1, 16 to 17. I lost that, so I have to start over. You, you, you see this? I have to start over because I lost that. So now I'm again, I'm going to click on belief. Look at the definition here. To believe, to put one's faith in, trust. That sounds just like the other word. That sounds just like the other word. So look here, this is trust in. Look, look at this word here. Look at the English transliteration, pistuo, pistuo. Everyone sees that, pistuo. So see this here, pistuo, P-I-S-T-E-O, uh, E-U-O. Now, again, you don't know faith, but just looking at, now I'm going to click on this. Now, if you notice here, do you see how these other faith click? It seems like they're the same word. Do you see how, watch, you see how I clicked here? And then the other ones pop up. Do you see that? it seems to be that they're connected in some way. The, the program is telling me that they're connected. So I can see this word, it's pistuo, pistuo. Now I'm gonna click on this faith word. It has the same root, P-I-S-T. The other one is P-I-S-T, the same. It looks the same. It's just the difference is a noun. This, the other was a verb, this is a noun. So let's come back here. Look at belief. Let's look at belief here. Okay, I'm going to come over here. This is to believe. So that's a verb, okay? Now, let's 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 take one more. Let me add one more thing here. I'm going to add the Greek. I'm going to add the Greek here so everyone can track with me. This you don't have to do this. This is going extra mile. I'm going to so I I click I click here. And then I'm going to pick a Bible or a commentary. So I'm going to click a Bible or commentary. And then I'm going to come over here. You see the toggle? I'm going to click. You can do all on the top right. You can do English. And then you can do ancient. So I'm going to ancient. And then I'm clicking on the SBL. So SBLG, Greek New Testament. Okay, so I'm going to click on this, okay? Okay, so now let's go and let's type enter again. Now, what happens when I click on this word?
Now, if you look down here, so this is where it's going to take some time. Look down. You don't have to look up in a physical lexicon, but you should be looking down here. If you go down here to this LSJ dictionary, do you see how it's giving, this is a future, this is a verb, okay? Does everyone see that it's a verb? This is functioning as a verb. But then the faith, if I click on faith, it's a noun, faith, faithfulness, belief, okay? All right, so is everyone tracking with me? So it's just one is a verb and one is a noun. That's why they look slightly different. That's why they use believe and that's why they use faith, but it's the same word. Is everyone tracking with me there? So this would, this would clearly answer the question, is belief and faith the same or different? It's the same. It's just one is in a verb form, one is in a noun form. By using this tool, you clearly have an answer without a shadow of a doubt, okay? So we can come back here and say, Now, I'm not expecting, this is going a little deep. I'm not expecting you to get this. I'm just trying to show you the power and the capability. And we'll just continue throughout the semester. We're just going to practice with this. We're going, I want you to become really good at using this tool. Okay, next we're going to do is we're going to define the word. Uh, okay. Tim, for, for a while. Uh, the other one is a verb to believe while, while the noun is faith. Yes. So when when you are, when somebody would ask how to be saved, you don't say. Uh, is it right to say you need to believe, because that is a response coming from you. So you so you can do you can say it like this you you need to believe or you need to have faith. To have faith. So that's because because to have faith faith is in the noun form Greek it's just one. <laughs> So that's why it's like that, yeah. So no, great question, Pastor Edwin. Thanks, great, thanks. great clarification, yeah. Great clarification. So, so, so then the next question is: we want to, we want to, we want to clarify though. So, so Pastor Edwin's question was: do we say believe or have faith? We can say both, but then we need to clarify because it's: is it just simply believing that there is a God, or is, or does this belief have? have much more uh, connotation than simply to believe that God exists, okay? So what I want to do first here is I want to, I want to just, I'm going to go back here and click on believe. And then when I come back here, there's several different options. So look here. Uh, if you look here, there's several options. Number one, you can have on the right to believe or give credit to. That's one option. Number two, to believe, to have a mental persuasion. So that, so that number two there, to have a mental persuasion, that literally is just to, um, that's just to have, to assent something. I, I, I accept that planes can fly, right? I believe planes can fly. That's just, you're accepting the truth. You're accepting something as truth, okay? But that's, so, so are we just accepting the gospel as truth or is it something more than that? So, so the first possibility in one context, it could be to believe or to give credit to. Another could be to believe as in to, to have a mental persuasion or to assent to the reality of something. Uh, number three, to believe in, that is to trust or to put one's faith in or on. So that is a different, that is much right? It's much stronger, okay? So this is a perfect example where you need to further define what, what is it? So let's go back here. This is a perfect example. So uh, looking here now, let's, 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 let's start a new, a new, uh, so we're, we're looking at word meaning. And we're defining, uh, belief belief and then what we're looking at is we're looking at word possibilities
And so the options that we laid out is number one, this is to believe as in to accept something as fact. I mean, that, that's, that's, getting, that's getting to the, to the nitty gritty. Accept, accept something as, as true, right? Something as, uh, to, to accept to a mental persuasion. They, they call it here mental persuasion. You're only accepting in the reality of something. Number two was this was to give credit to, right? And then number three was to, uh, to trust in or have faith. So those are three options. Those are three totally different things. We've got to get to the heart of this because this is fundamental. What is our job to respond to the gospel? Simply to accept it as true or to submit to it, okay? So we're going to go back here. We're going to go back here, and I'm going to do the same thing. Bam, bam. I'm going to go back to, to, to I'm going to start, I'm going to clean my slate. X this out. I'm going to do now, watch this. Let me just go, uh, I'm sorry. Let's go back to Romans 1, 16 to 17. So I'm clicking on this. And then I'm going to click on this belief. So what I want to do now is I want to look up both. We need to look up the noun form and the verb form. Just not the verb form, okay? So let me just see here. I'm going to do both, okay? So let's do this one first. And then I'm going to limit this to Romans. So looking at Romans 1, 1 to 5, through whom we have received. So this is the, this is the closest context to to Romans 1.16, but besides Romans 1.17, okay? Romans 1.5, through whom we have, so through whom, that's Jesus. Through, through Jesus, we have grace, we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith. <laughs> you can just, that's it, you're done. The obedience of faith. So Romans 1.5, Paul says they've been given apostleship for the obedience of faith. Now, some people will say it's obedience that, that faith produces. So the faith produces obedience. Uh, some people will say obedience. What kind of obedience? Faith. So obedience uh, so some will say, so, so the first category of people will say, how do you define this? Number one, uh, faith produces obedience. Others will say, no, 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 no. Faith equals obedience. And others will say, Plus. Faith, obedience. <laughs> faith, obedience. <laughs> Let me see here. Uh, or, or others will speak of obedient faith. Now, what I want to say here is that in some sense, we're splitting hairs. In some sense, we're splitting hairs because to have faith is to obey. And we saw that in Romans 10, right? We saw that in Romans, oh, Romans 10, 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. <laughs> so so in, in, in a certain sense here, I think that, I think that to, this is an instance where it's, we're just splitting hairs. The, 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 the idea here is that 
Faith, for sure, produces obedience. Yes. Uh, by having faith, we are obeying God. So it's, what I'm trying to say, it, this will be an example where it's all the above. <laughs> this is just, it's just, it's pregnant. When Paul says, the obedient of faith among the nations, he's referring to the nations submitting to having trust, to, to being in union with Christ, to trusting, to, to obeying the commands. It's just, it's, it's just this pregnant term. His gospel, his, his apostleship is to bring about the face obedience among the nations, okay? But so, so in one sense, we're splitting hairs. We can define it as this. But the big takeaway among Akapatid is that this clearly, it has to be this. And then this is this uh, this further defines further defines. Okay, so but this is a broader context. This is a broader context proof, right? The broader context. This is the broader context. This is eleven verses before. Okay, so this is what we're talking about. Reading it in context. This is exactly what we're talking about. Reading in context. Romans 1.5 is on the mind of Paul. So he says that my apostleship is to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of, it, for his, sake of his name among the nations. Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. What, what belief? It's the obedience of faith. We can literally substitute for everyone who is obedient in faith to, to Christ. <laughs> same, same. Okay, so then at this point, we're just, we clearly know, and we're just going to do two more proofs just to further confirm. So we can look at other passages. So looking at the broader context uh, I have here in Romans, in Ro uh, let's go back here. Just looking back here, Romans 1.8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith has been proclaimed in all the world. Uh, Romans. Romans uh, 1 12 that we may be mutual encouraged by each other's faith look look at 322 how about this for how about this for faith equating to belief look at 322 the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus for all who believe <laughs> so it's, there's the equation there there is no distinction there's no distinction uh, 328, we hold that one is justified by faith. Continuing on here. Uh, then you have in Romans 4, Abraham is the pattern of faith. Abraham is the pattern of faith. 119, he did not weaken in faith when he considered his body as good as dead, when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. Verse 20, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. Uh, Romans 5.1, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. So it just, it's clearly belief and faith are the same, and it's obedient faith. It's, it's obedience, whether it comes from, <laughs> comes from faith, we're clinging in obedience. So it's just, it's all of the above. And so that clearly defines, you, you see how this, this, this type of study is just giving you so much information. It's giving you so much information to help, to help you uh, to define what we're, what's going on here. Okay. Um, and we have not yet even gone outside of Romans. <laughs> Goodness. No need to go outside Romans. It's there. Uh, the other thing is we, we, we also did not yet explore belief. So you'd also want to do look up belief. We just looked at faith, okay? Well, we clearly see. So it's, we're okay now, okay now. So any comments or questions? I hope this is making sense. Maybe, I hope you're not stressed. Maybe some here will be, will be challenged to go to James. We're in faith without works is dead. <laughs> It's a yes. word, it's that obedience and the faith. <laughs> yeah, no, it, but, but do you see here that really, this really, James just, it's just like they're together, right? because James is saying the same thing, right? Great challenge, Pastor Edwin. 
go and study James and see, look at, look at, look at the parallel. Look at the parallel now. Perhaps James just makes perfect sense. Because <laughs> you're like, wow, James and Paul were the same. <laughs> they were the same. Oh my goodness. Oh wow, it's, it's 8.19. So let's take another break. Let's take seven minute break. So if you're on, so everyone can see this. If you're on this page here, uh, you're just gonna go to the, to the top right and then you can download. Download steps. So I'm going to click on download. Yeah, it has a lot. Wow. 450 Bibles and commentaries. It's good. Very helpful. Yeah, yeah. This is actually my, my this is really, the, I would say, the best Bible software on the internet. And probably the best free one, too. Yeah. Yeah, they have Filipino here. Look at this. You can, they got Filipino as well. This is, a, this is great. Oh, I turned it to Philippine. Oh, okay, here, hold on here. Just bear with me one second. So that's, oh, so you're, you can change the toggle. So did everyone see that? You can change here, you can change the language so that when it's coming up here, it's all explained in Tagalog. Does everyone see that here? So the, the explanation is in Tagalog. <laughs> yeah, look at that. So you want to go, you want to go to this here, this, this, toggle top right and then you can change it to to filipino but here so what later on the ancient bibles we have greek we have the old testament as well so those who would want to study greek the greek old testament the greek new testament they have it they have the hebrew they have hebrew they have greek they have latin so you can look at the vulgate as well and the vulgate looks like i don't know it might not be tagged yet but yeah, you, you, I mean, you're paying hundreds of dollars to get programs like this, and this is free. This is accessible. So um, very powerful. Yeah, so they have good commentaries here as well. Can this be downloaded on, on Android? Uh, let me go back here. Let me see. Maybe not. Yeah, I don't think so because it's saying OS X. So you would, it would just be for the computer. But I don't. Yes, sir, I'm checking right now. I'm trying to download and I, I'm going to open and check it. Okay. I think there is. For Android? Yeah, yeah, for Android. I'm trying to download it here on my cell phone. There is, but I don't know up to what capability it has. Ah, uh, okay. I, I'll check out because I, I, I'll check out my phone as well. Um, I don't have it with me, but um, that's really good. So they have it for Android as well. Wow. That's really good. I check the Kia kung pwede yan no Kia 3310. But yeah, it, it's, uh, yes, there is, there is. So it works. There is, yeah, it works. Mm -hmm. Actually, ito, tinray ko yung Sir Romans. And it has a translation for uh, Greek and the uh, definition. But it's limited only for ESV. Okay. And ESV and Chinese Union version, C-U-V-S. That's wow, the only so two versions. Be very handy. Yes, very yes. Very handy. And down, uh, what do you call this? Offline version. Wow. So what I would really recommend everyone is a great way to read the Bible and study it. Yes, yeah, so what I'd really recommend is that there are different videos here. I think there's five. There's nine. This is really helpful. So if you have time, each one are under 15 minutes. Yeah, I would definitely uh it would be definitely worth your time to uh, to look at these. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm going to I'm gonna share this link on our right now. I'm gonna share this. So if you can if you can think about this, the idea of step it's that you're adding different components as you're searching. So like if you we we did like Romans and then we did the different words. That's kind of the, I believe that's the thinking behind this idea of step. 
you're just adding different steps and then you're searching to get the information. I could be mistaken, but I think that's the, that's the design. That's the thing. Okay. Let's go ahead and get back. Let's get, let's get back into it. Let's finish tonight because it's getting late now. Um, it's already 8.30. So let's, let's go back to our study. Now, let's look at this. Let's look at this salvation word now. Let's look at this salvation word, okay? Now, when we look at salvation, let's, let's first look at, is word meaning going to help us? I'm going to ask this question. And think about how you want to define this word. And I'm, gonna, I'm asking the question first, is a word meaning going to be helpful for us? Let's, let's go to Step Bible, and, and I want you to be thinking, and then I'm going to ask you, you tell me if you think it's helpful or we need, to find, we need to use a different, to get to this idea of salvation when we preach it, do we need to do a different type of investigation? So let's go back to Step Bible. And let's try this again. And you're, I want you to tell me. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on salvation. So I'm clicking on salvation. So then when I look over here, what does salvation mean? It seems to only mean one, one set of things. So there's several synonyms. The idea of saving, preservation, rescue, deliverance. Okay? So that's, those are synonyms for the same thing. Does everyone see that here? So if we're doing a word study, is a word, is a word, is a word meaning type study, is that going to be helpful for us? What do you think? If that's our primary definition, saving, preservation, rescue, deliverance, is that really going to help us? The options are saving, Deliverance, preservation, rescue. Yes, I, I think this is helpful because it, it could answer the question. Uh, why, why do we need rescuing or why do we need deliver, to be delivered from? No, so that's great. So, so this, this so well, well first, let's, let's ask a first question. Uh, Kea, are these, are these different words or, or closer to the same idea? What would you say? They are closer to the same idea. Yeah, so, uh, so essentially, we could say that these are almost the, 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 the same thing, right? They're almost the same thing. But yes. you're right. That's what you said was really good, that these, that these segue us, these set us up to, to discuss uh, why we, I think you said why we need saving, right? Yes. Excellent. So... In one sense, doing the word meaning study was great. It set us up. But in another sense, it was deficient because it was like saving from what, right? Or why? Why do we need saving? You know, what, what is, so, so this leads us, so this is going to lead us on to, um, I, I say word reference, because now what we're going to investigate is, is maybe the, the reason or the, uh, we could say reason or the, the, the what, what are we being saved from, right? The what? So, but we're looking at a referent. We're, what is it referring to? What is that salvation referring to? We're not defining salvation. It's already defined for us. We're asking the, the what. So, so coming down here for, so I want you to think about it. So if you have your Bibles and you can look around, Look around in the broader context of Romans and tell me what you think we need saving from, okay? Pastor Henry, you're not allowed to answer. You've already had this class. <laughs> you know, you know. Um, uh, but if no one else gets it, then I will allow you to jump in and to save the day. So 
<laughs> no pun intended. I should say pun intended. Uh, what, what are we in need of saving from? I'm going to write this down. I want you to be thinking about it and someone give an answer. From the penalty of sin. Okay, from the penalty of sin. So, yeah, yes, good. So let's, let's, let's do this here. So um, penalty of sin. So, so talk to me about that, Ray. Why do I need to be saved from the penalty of sin? I don't care. I, you know, you know, I have my, my neighbors always trying to find me because I, I, I don't, I leave my trash out and it goes into his lot, but I just ignore his, his penalties. Because, because in, in it, the penalty of sin goes with it, the wrath of God for those. The wrath of God. Where, where did you see that? Where did you see that, Ray? Reference. <laughs> That's in the one, Romans. I need a reference. I need a reference. Romans 118. Romans 118, yeah. That's... How far is that from our context? How far? How far? Okay, here we go. Here we go. So number one, uh, so the, the question is what? And then uh, Kuya Ray was right. We need, we need the penalty of sin from the penalty of sin. And then so, but specifically, we're identifying wrath of God, right? Wrath of God. Wrath of God. This is the context is Romans, Romans 1. 18. So you see how Romans 1.18, that's, that's only two verses. That's the broader context. Everyone, everyone sees that? Wrath of God. So let's look, let's look at the wrath of God. I'm going to highlight. Okay, so we're, we're looking to define this idea of, so we have salvation there, right? We're, we're defining salvation. What are we being saved from? We have Wrath of God, right? Right, unrighteousness, right? We know that that the judgment of God. So, penalty of sin, judgment of God. It's the same context. It's a different word. Penalty of sin is meted out. God gives out the penalty of sin when He judges. His wrath comes when He judges. Okay, how will you escape the judgment of God? So this is now I am I am establishing a strong context of why why we need salvation how will you escape the judgment of god storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when god's righteous judgment will be revealed i mean this is just oh my goodness the, the proofs are just of, of, of abundance wrath and fury for unrighteousness will perish, will be judged. When God judges the secrets through Jesus Christ, all are under sin. Look at the conclusion here. We know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable for by the works of the law, no human being will be justified, declared righteous. So I just circled, what was it, 10 things? 10, 10, 10 contextual reasons why salvation, let's be clear here. Salvation in the primary issue. Okay, so let's, let's define. How has people defined, how have Okay, so we, we identified the correct, Kuyare got the correct answer, wrath of God. How have people defined, what, what do we need salvation from? How have people defined it? What do we need salvation from? Give me some other things we need to be saved from. Some, some reason out us so you can go to heaven. Uh, can you just repeat, you just cut out. So you can go to heaven, so yeah, that okay. is the, the definition. But you can you can really see here that if you're going to 
also to emphasize the wrath of God. But maybe they will be led to fear. That's why yeah. they will believe. Yeah, so the, no, you're right. There is this, there is a fear component. And I think there is, uh, we should preach the wrath of God because there is a, there should be that fear component because even Jesus warned of the coming judgment. But it's not in a manipulative sense. It's in a speaking truth sense. Um, uh, I, I would say, I would say that no doubt people talk about salvation going to heaven, but by definition, by definition, salvation is deliverance. Uh, means, or, or we could say rescue. So that does that does put that does put it in a better in a better understanding. So going to heaven kind of misses the point because salvation isn't so much going somewhere but being rescued from something. Now, once you're rescued from that thing, the path that God has ordained for us is to be with him. So I'm not saying that that's not true, but it, it's kind of confusing the idea. Salvation fundamentally is, so like for example, right? Israel was rescued. They were saved from Egypt, the great salvation of the Lord. They were rescued from the bondage of Egypt, right? So people will talk about here the bondage of sin, right? We need to be rescued from the bondage of sin, correct? We will also talk about um, rescue from the dominion of darkness, This is Romans 6. This is uh, Colossians 1, uh, 13, uh, 14, 13 to 14, right? So I'm not saying that, that this, this is wrong. I'm not, I'm not saying that this is wrong or this is wrong. But fundamentally, fundamentally, if we were to say fundamentally, what is our problem? Fundamentally, our problem is... Fundamentally, our problem is what, what, what should most frighten us is not Satan. It's not the fact that we're enslaved to sin. What should frighten us the most is that God's wrath is being revealed. God's wrath is coming. God's wrath is being, in the words of, in the, words of the gospel, God's wrath is being stored up for yourself in the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment is revealed. Why do we need to be saved? Because right now we have hard and unrepentant hearts and we are storing up for ourselves God's wrath and we need to be rescued from that. And we can't do it ourselves. Okay? So when we define salvation, when we preach this sermon, um, now, in saving us from the penalty of sin, the Romans 6, we are also saved, Romans 7, we are saved from the bondage of sin. Yes, there, uh, but that's not the fundamental issue. The, our fundamental issue is not Satan. I'm more afraid of God than I am of Satan. <laughs> Maybe we're not, but we should. We should be. Um, any comments or questions, or is this making sense? Probably an addition thing. Yeah. Uh, redeem us from the empty way of life. But I, I want to be I want to be clear here. Okay, so I'm going to be very clear here. Okay, these are sub. This is a uh, you could say as a, a subset. Uh, most fundamental. I just want us to be clear here, okay? So in, in preaching this, it, it would not be wrong to talk about bondage of sin, darkness, dominion of darkness, but those are minor compared to the wrath of God. They are minor. Good. Any other comments or questions? I'm going to do righteousness of God. We're running out of time, so I'm going to bring out my notes and we're going to just discuss this. So I, I will share this with you. I will share this with you later. So righteousness of God. 
So in looking at righteousness, when I look up in Step Bible, it's primarily this idea of the act of doing what is in agreement with God's standard. Okay, that's how you define righteousness. Again, that's helpful for defining the term, but again, it's deficient because we want to know what does righteousness of God. This is a phrase. And so just doing a word study in the typical sense will not get at this idea of, of righteousness of God. When, now, sometimes you just need to go to the commentaries to read the different options. So I went to the commentaries to read, and there's really three ideas here of what does righteousness of God mean? There's really three ideas, so let me just highlight them. Number one, people will say, it's the attribute of righteousness which characterizes God. So that's what it means to God's righteousness. It's his attribute, okay? Other people will say, and especially in the Old Testament, it says it's God's saving activity. So it'll oftentimes talk about, in a parallel context, salvation of God, God's righteousness. And so it's really, uh, it's really God's faithfulness to his covenant. God's righteousness is him being faithful to his covenant. That's another sense. And then the third sense, which is really accurate and you really see it in Romans, is this idea of the covenant is the right relationship that God gives to us, i.e. he's giving us his righteousness so that we can be with him. Okay? When I look at the word choice, let's go down now to word choice. Okay, so I'm going down to word choice. I really included two ideas in the word choice because I, both are true in Romans. And I, I define both in the context. So righteousness denotes the idea that God is faithful to his covenant or he, in, in his saving activity. Um, and then also which he, he, his righteousness, which he gives as a gift to Christ. So really there's two ideas here. There's this faithfulness to his covenant and saving, and saving, uh, uh, saving activity, and also he gives us his righteousness. And then I have different grammatical proofs, broader context proof, that really show that both are correct. Okay? Um, we're kind of out of time. I don't want to go belabor. I'll post this so that you can see. Um, but both are really true. Both are really true. So if you were to find... What is righteousness of God? Number one. Number one. Let me just blow this up here. Let me just separate this. So there's two ideas. Number one. Let me just change the color here so you can see. When it says the righteousness is, is being revealed from faith for faith, just as it has been written, the righteous shall live by faith. There's really two ideas here. And both are present in the Gospel of Romans. And I do believe that this idea of righteousness of God, it's just this pregnant idea. So again, I am not following the typical one, one word meaning. And, and in your assignments, you are, you're only to pick one. <laughs> so you're only to pick one. But I'm, 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 I've, I've chosen this again because some of these ideas, they're just, they're multifaceted. And I've really chosen righteousness of God because people don't really understand this idea of righteous, righteousness of God. Number one, it's the idea that God is faithful to his covenant. In order for, God, in order for us to receive salvation, God has to act. <laughs> if God will not act, we will not be saved, okay? And in that action, he has to act. But in order for us to be in his presence forevermore, we need his, his righteousness and that he is the only one that's perfect. Christ is perfect. Christ gives us his righteousness. That is his, uh, remember, I'm going back up here to the standard. It's the standard of, of doing what is right or doing, uh, uh, maintaining God's standard. That's what righteousness literally is. So Christ gives us that standard so that whenever God sees us, whether we're glorified or in the pre-glorified state, he doesn't see us. He sees our union with Christ and he sees his son in us. So those are the two ideas. And Paul is just going to expound upon that. And it's going to culminate in this idea of union with Christ. What is true of the son is true of those that are in union with him. So uh, if, he did not, if he gave over his son, how will he not with him give us all things? Romans 8. 
if he gave us the son, he's going to give us all things with Christ. So it's this idea of union with Christ, okay? But, but I want us to emphasize in looking at this righteousness of God, it is both his faithfulness to save, faithfulness to save us, and also the gift of this perfect standard that Christ obeyed perfectly and then gave to us. And we are clothed in Christ's righteousness. And when God looks on us on that judgment, he's, well, in faith, having therefore been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Um, and just lastly, that, that wrath of God is compared to peace with God. So Romans 1, 1 to 3, wrath of God is coming. Romans, Romans 3 and 4, righteousness by faith. Romans 5, 1, having been justified by faith, we have peace. That word peace is so powerful. It is so powerful. We have peace with God. Okay, you know, this is going to be good. And, I, and I, the last thing I want to say is that as we continue in EVST throughout the other courses, I'm really becoming convinced of, of the big projects being different studies like this. Maybe not the whole process, but sections, portions, because one of the weaknesses Monocopathy in the seminary, and perhaps Pastor Edward, you've been through the process at CGST. You know, part of it is it, it's a long time ago. They don't really have the, the te technology. COVID has forced us to do this. But for me as well, you, you don't really, you're not really saturated in the method and in the practice. And so it's hard to make those adjustments. If we can really become saturated and practicing these, using these tools, that's really going to, to save and to help. So I just want you to be thinking about that. And um, I, will post, I will post my example. Again, don't be stressed. It's going to be long. There's going to be a lot of different proofs. I am in no way expecting or wanting you to do that. I'm just offering different type examples of proofs so that you can think, oh, I can have this proof. Oh, I can write it this way. So that's really the reason. It's, it's going to be a lot so that you have, it's like a smorgasbord. You're going to all you can eat. And it's, it's, it's a lot of different uh, types of food that you can taste. Um, Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Can you pray for us, Queen Dario? Go ahead and pray for us. Close us in prayer. Uh, yes, Father God, uh, good evening. Uh, yan, natatapos kami ang amun, amun class. Thank you, po. Like, thank you for your word. Thank you for Pastor Tim to, to share his knowledge to us. God, just uh, thank you so much for just uh, your spirit being with us and just guiding us, Father. I ask for just a special blessing for each one, each one here. And um, I just really, uh, I thank you for their faithfulness. And I just ask that your spirit would lead us as we seek to grow. We want to do your will. We want to love you. And I just thank you for people's, everyone's here, their commitment to you and to your word. Um, it's in Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things. 